Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's another exciting day for us to be in Jesus, isn't it? Amen. I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that those of you out in uh, internet land are with us as well. Um, it's interesting the way God keeps expanding our ministry. And uh, used to be when we started doing the, the uh, uh, online service that, you know, maybe we'd get 20 or 30 views a week. Uh, now most weeks we're up around 100. Now, for all I know, they're joining and watching the song service, and when that other guy stands up, they're like, oh boy, we gotta go move on to jo Joel Osteen or something like that. I, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe they go and look for David Poling on the internet. I'm, I'm not sure. But, uh, so happy to have some guests with us today. Uh, our friend Paulo from Hampton is, is with us, and uh, David and Lynn Poling from uh, all the way from Hong Kong. And uh, well, I'll, let me go ahead and do my introduction right now. How about that? Okay. okay. Um, I had never heard of David and Lynn Poling until we moved to Hampton 27 or so years ago. And when you move to a new church, you get to meet new people and have the opportunity to hear about new missionaries that you've never heard about before. And I, I looked at the list of missionaries in the church there in Hampton, and there was one on there that obviously had a very large goal. It was called Reaching the Billion. And uh, I'm not sure that you've quite reached all the billion yet, but God still got you there, so that's good. Uh, but to get to know David and Lynn over these years and uh, watch their ministry and watch their family grow and watch as, as they've gone through lots of different things, it, it's been exciting. They're great servants of the Lord. And I'm so pleased that uh, they're able to be with us. David's going to be speaking for us. Uh, Lynn will give you a rebuttal afterwards if you ask her, uh, but uh, uh, in all seriousness, it, they're just a great couple and great servants of God. So let's, uh, let's stand together, and uh, we'll pray, and then we'll lift our hearts in worship and continue to worship Him. Thank you, Father, for the joy that you give us as we open our hearts up to you. Father, even if we don't sing a note or hear a note, Father, if our hearts are in tune with you, we are worshiping and growing closer to you. Thank you for being with us uh, for, for this time. Help us, Father, to, to be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for joining us today. And if, if you are comfortable, stand as we worship our Lord and Savior. Come, now is the time to worship. Praise his name, for the Lord is good, 
and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Amen. Amen. Um, continue as we lift our, your voices sound so wonderful today in lifting them up to God. Um, oh God, you are my God. Sing it loud. Oh God, you are my God.
morning. Hey, today is a communion meditation. I want to talk about the gospel. Apostle Paul said uh, the gospel is the power of God for salvation to those who believe. I think it's for those who believe. If you don't believe, the power of the gospel, is, it won't work for you. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of, uh, of the gospel because it's the power of God. Uh, he said, if you confess with your mouth, you know, say verbally, and Jesus is Lord, and you believe that uh, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Because with your heart, you believe. And with your mouth, you, you, you profess that uh, Jesus uh, rise from the dead. Because it, that's Romans 10, 9 and 10, and Romans, whoever call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, yeah. So what's the gospel? The gospel is, uh, I found it in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. Paul said, I, 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 I believe this gospel. Uh, if you also believe that uh, as Christ died for our sin, he was buried and rose again. So that's the, that's the gospel. That uh, die is died for our sin, and he shed his blood for us so we, we can be saved. So after you hear, you hear the gospel, then what? So if you believe the gospel, the Holy Spirit will seal you, will come to you, that God will own you. You will be, you will be owned by God, you will be sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. The Ephesians 1, 1 16, that the, the Holy Spirit is the down payment, so it's guaranteed. So, like uh, if you're buying a house, you make sure you will uh, finish the contract. You you will not back out, so you have to put the down payment. So the Holy Spirit is the down payment for our salvation. So God will not back out. Will not. Uh, so it guarantee will be saved. So so let. Let, let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that you raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You promised that you that you will save us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Regarding the opera, I just want to read the scripture, Second Corinthians 9, 6 to 8. But we shall sow sparingly, shall reap also sparingly, with so bountifully, shall reap also with bountifully. Every man according as he prosper in his heart, so let him give not gradually or out of necessity, but God love the cheaper giver. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sammy. Appreciate that. A uh, couple of announcements, four to be exact. Uh, this coming Friday is our next class on defending the faith. And if you haven't come out yet, please join us. Uh, we also do a Zoom meeting for this, but uh, there's just nothing quite like being there. 
And so as we have the opportunity to learn how to uh, share the hope that we have in Christ, uh, please join us uh, this Friday at 6 p.m. Uh, Tuesday morning, 8 a.m. is our Bible study that we've just begun about a month ago. And uh, you may notice the tables have been expanded, a few more chairs around there, so now there's room for you too. <laughs> so please join us if you can. Of course, Wednesday evening, we... Okay, books still available. Uh, Wednesday evenings, we're still uh, in the uh, uh, Christian Doctrine book and uh, finishing up talking about the Second Coming. And uh, so again, uh, Wednesday by Zoom or being here at uh, 6 p.m. And then uh, announcing for the first time, I guess you'd say, uh, Resurrection Sunday will be on April 9th this year. And we'll start at 6.30 out at the beach and then come back here for breakfast at 7.30 and then prayer time Sunday school and, and uh, worship time. And we're celebrating the most important thing, and that is that Jesus died, was buried, and has been raised back to life for you and me. And uh, talking about this now is so that you have opportunity to invite somebody. They don't have to wear a tie. They don't, I mean, they don't even have to wear a shirt if they wear a coat over. Uh, but anyways, uh, it would be a little bit chilly out there. Uh, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yes, uh, Mike is already kind of uh, devising his path to the kitchen to get the bacon before it comes out here. So make sure you come early. That's right. Uh, any other announcements? All right, very good. Um, let's take a look at our prayer list. Uh, there are opportunities to pray for lots of people. Uh, people in Ukraine, people in Russia, people who are impacted by the war there, and many other factors. People in Syria, people in Turkey, uh, many, many tens of thousands who have died because of the, the massive earthquake. People all around the world who need Jesus. And uh, at quite a number of years ago, David, I don't know how many years ago this was, but I thought I was doing pretty good on our prayer list each week at the other church there in Hampton. I, I put pray for our missionaries. And, and David, in his own kind way, but, but direct way, which is good with me, don't, don't beat around the bush with me. Just tell me what it is. Maybe I'll get it. He said, you know, it would be far better if you prayed for missionaries individually instead of just put pray for missionaries. Oh, obviously that hadn't occurred to me, so I was glad he pointed it out. And uh, so we have the opportunity to pray for missionaries and pray for David and Lynn. Uh, pray for... Uh, Camp Rudolph, that's gearing up for a new season. Uh, pray for Matthew. Uh, pray for Waypoint Ministries. Pray for uh, Albania, uh, for the, 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 the Costas over there. You might be aware of other missionaries. Uh, I, I pray for my sister Rhonda and her husband Craig. And by the way, thank you for your continued prayers for Rhonda. We believe that she has her last chemo treatment tomorrow. And uh, yes, yes, and, and hopefully that's exactly what it will be. Uh, many other mission, and, and they, they do work down in Mexico and Cuba, uh, by the way. So pray for missionaries and pray for them by name. Uh, pray for workers here. I always appreciate it when somebody says they're praying for me. I'm not sure if they're praying for my jokes to get better or exactly what, but uh, pray for me. That'd be great. Okay. Okay. Uh, Hot off the press, um, Alan's dad, and Alan is, is Christina's husband, and uh, pray for Christina, and pray for Erlene as well, but um, uh, Alan's dad, Anthony Orofino, uh, has cancer now, so please pray for that family. Uh, any other prayer needs, any other praises to be offered up to the Father? Dave? As long as we have David and Lynn here. Yes. We did. We found out during the Sunday school presentation they had a severe need for teachers in my Okay. Teachers in Hong Kong. Very good. Okay. Father, thank you for the, the blessings you give us that you are with 
our loved ones. You are with our enemies. Help us to share Jesus in a meaningful way by, by living the gospel, as Sammy says, the good news, that's unto salvation. Help us to, to share uh, in our words that good news that we have received. Father, thank you for being with so many that we don't know and probably will never meet. I think especially of the countries that we just mentioned with earthquakes and wars. Father, there's so much that's in this world that is, is difficult. And the best solution is that they need Jesus. And that we need to share Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of worshiping your name and lifting you up. Thank you, Father, for each one who's here today, each one within the sound of my voice who can pray and praise you. Father, there might be many who are struggling, many who are uncertain about who God is in their lives, who you are in their lives. Father, help us to share our own struggles and the solutions that you've given us that we might help others to walk more closely to you. Thank you, Father, for being with David while he shares with us today and for David and Lynn being with us that uh, we can be encouraged, that we can also help to reach the billion and the billions more. Thank you, Father. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. David, if you would. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, well, we'll break this up. Good. This section first. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And then these guys. Good morning. And then. Good morning. Okay. I, I want you to wait when I start at least. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. We need a picture. Okay. Uh, in Sunday school, we had a quiz. Now in church, we get a quiz too. Where is Alvin, Texas? Oh, all right. I knew there'd be a wise guy in the middle. Theodore and Sylvester. Ah, it doesn't actually look like that. It's Alvin is Gulf Coastal Plain. So, but um, let me try a different question. Who is Nolan Ryan? <laughs> Wow. Well, well, you know, when I was in junior high, he was pitching professional baseball. When I was in college, he was pitching professional baseball. When we got married, moved to Illinois and spent five years in Illinois, he was preaching, he was professional pitcher. We went to Hong Kong in the first 10 years we were in Hong Kong. He was longer than the first 10 years in Hong Kong. So from the 60s to the 90s. Yes. Um, well, guess where his hometown is? And if you go to Alvin, Texas, there's this wonderful barbecue restaurant called Joe's Barbecue. Uh, that would be worth moving from Virginia to Texas for. <laughs> and it's the most famous restaurant in the area. And you go in, they have Nolan Ryan paraphernalia, his, his cap, his jersey or whatnot. At one point for several years, they even had a set of his shoes. Oh and and he has big feet. Must be Texas, you know. <laughs> but you know, it's the thing that hometown boy makes good. We're proud of it, and so they're excited that you know uh, they may have no other claim to fame, but <laughs> Owen Ryan's from Alvin, Texas. You better remember that. Well, uh, in Luke chapter four. Something similar happens. So, um, yeah, we'll have to read this together. <laughs> Luke chapter 4, verse 14. And Jesus, armed with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee. And oh, well, yeah, I said together. Okay. We can do this together. Uh, start from the beginning again. One, two, three. Then Jesus, armed with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee. And reports about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogue, and all men sang his praises. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, 
as the Rager he did. He stood up to read, and was handed him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He opened the scroll and found the passage which says, oh, back up. <laughs> Obviously, the chapter, fourth chapter of Luke with 24 chapters, you just started Jesus' story. Uh, the third chapter, he got baptized. The fourth chapter, he, he the temptations. So this is really just the beginning of Jesus' story, but he's always fa already famous. He's been performing miracles, and so and people are excited about him, and so he comes back to Nazareth, the hometown, and of course, well, our famous Nazareth neighbor should get to share in the synagogue service. So he comes in the synagogue, and... and and they said, okay, Jesus, you read the scripture. And you read the scripture, you also get to comment on the scripture. So, but you see, he stands up to read. So Jewish, even Orthodox today, you read the scripture, everybody stands to show the respect for the scripture. And then, the 20th verse, Jesus is going to sit down. Everybody else keeps standing. Jesus' time, the preacher sat. Everybody else stood. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it makes the preacher comfortable. He'll probably go on and on and on. <laughs> and if anybody starts to get, you know, there's a danger, you bump into the one next to you or fall over. So, you know, you have to stay awake. And, but then it says they gave him the scroll, Isaiah. Uh, today we say Isaiah has 66 chapters. They didn't have chapters and verses then. And so Jesus is going to pick a particular passage from Isaiah 61. That means he has to know where that is. Otherwise, it's going to be unroll, unroll, scroll, 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 scroll. <laughs> and everybody else is standing there waiting for him to find the right passage. So Jesus obviously was very familiar with Scripture. He knew where in that huge, long Isaiah scroll, the passage we say is Isaiah 61 today. And so he came and he read that passage. And so uh, now we get to read it. So next one. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. He has sent me to announce good news to the poor, proclaim release for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to let the oppressed go free. Proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And all the eyes in the synagogue were fixed on him. Continue. And he began to speak. Today, he said, in your very hearing, this text has come true. And there was a general stir of admiration. They were surprised that words of such grace should fall from his lips. Is not this Joseph's son, they asked. Then Jesus said, No doubt you will quote the proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And say, We have heard of all you're doing to Capernaum. Do the same here in your own hometown. I tell you this, he went on, No prophet is accepted in his own country. There were many widows in Israel, you may be sure, and Elijah's time, when for three years and six months the skies never opened, and famine lay hard over the whole country. Yet it was to none of those that Elijah was sent, but to a widow at Serakta in the territory of Sidon. Again, in the time of the prophet Elijah, there were many lepers in Israel, and not one of them was healed, but only Naaman, Syria. At these words, the whole congregation was infuriated. They leaped up, threw him out of the town, took him to the brow of the hill on which it was built, meaning to hurl him over the edge. But he walked straight through them all and went away. Starts out, a good start, but then it changes. Uh, Jesus reads this passage from Isaiah 61. And the passage starts out by saying that, next page, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. That God has anointed me, the word Messiah, same word, Mashiach, comes from this. The Lord has anointed me, just like he anointed David, anointed Saul. 
the Old Testament, you pour oil on somebody's head so the flies would land and can't fly away. And that shows that God has chosen you. And so my dad's, my dad's time then, that was a, you know, you're a smart guy and then you had the grease. And the, some of you remember that era. And it wouldn't do me any good now. But, um, God chose somebody. They poured oil on their head. God has a special mission for this person, uh, whether to be king, whether to be high priest, whether to be prophet. Uh, whether to save God's people. Isaiah 61 says God is going to anoint somebody, not with oil, but with his spirit to save, to proclaim, to free. So he says that Jesus received the spirit in order to carry out his mission, just as Jesus' people today, Christians, received the spirit to carry out his mission, to do something that we could not do by our own power, God gives us the power to do what God wants us to do. God empowers us to carry out his mission, his commission. It's a lot like you, know, you have small children and it's your birthday and they ask you for money so they can buy a gift for you. And, you know, that's what we're like. I can't change somebody's heart. I can't make somebody believe in Jesus. I can't comfort a broken person. But God's Spirit can. Amen. God through us can. So God works through us to do what we couldn't do on our own. And empowers us to do what we don't have the power to do. So I look at China today and think, who is winning China? Who is reaping the world's largest mission field? Farmers. Mechanics. Kindergarten teachers. Waiters. Be fair, waitresses too. <laughs> people with no training. People with, at least superficially, no power, no gifts. But they have God. They have God's power working in and through them, and God has been reaping uh, way back when I was young. That was a while ago. Um, and Matt was young too. <laughs> when I was young, people said China is closed. The Iron Curtain is closed. Uh, Cultural Revolution, there are people saying there are no Christians today in China because they were cut off from Western influence and Western mission. And Cultural Revolution ended and we discovered two or three million Christians had turned into perhaps a hundred million Christians. The greatest evangelistic expansion in the history of Christianity happened to a persecuted church. God's power works through us to do what we couldn't do otherwise. Uh, there's a, uh, I'll choose the right word for this, a subterranean assembly. because I can't use the right word for it because it goes online and, you know, um, that just before it left for maybe four and a half years ago, uh, got a phone call and said, uh, this is a fire department, we need to inspect your premises. And so would you come unlock the door? And the guy who held the keys came down, he unlocked the door and there were no firemen there, but there were 30 some policemen. Mm -hmm representatives of four different government departments. And they told them, you know, you have to stop meeting. You're closed down. Take the stuff away. So they lost their meeting place. They lost their out the right to meet. And then uh, COVID hit and we couldn't cross the border. And most of their preaching before had been done by myself and my students. So they lost their meeting place, their right to meet, their preachers. And then last year, the government announced that you can no longer do religious things online. So originally, you're not supposed to meet in person, but you can't meet online either. So what are you supposed to do? And you know what happened? Uh, they started a Bible study program last year that if I had recommended, maybe one in four would have signed up for it. 
but this was, they themselves brought it up, 100%, everybody in the church signed up for it, and then it wasn't read a chapter or two a day, it was, you know, like 10, 12 chapters every day, and when you finish a book, you have to write a book report. You know, how did the book of Hosea impact your spiritual life? What verses do you think were best in it? And in six months, they finished the Bible. 100%. So my Bible college students don't do that. <laughs> and not having the help from outside that they used to, by the way, of preachers, there are two people in the church that now preach. They couldn't before. God raised them up. God trained them. And now they're helping other church get started. So, uh, cut off from your previous leadership, preachers, uh, denied the right to meet, denied a place to meet, <laughs> denied the right to meet online, and what happens? They thrived. They grew because they depended on God. And God honored that. God worked through them. God has continued to work through them. So God's spirit is in your heart in your life, and he wants to work in your life and do things that you can't do by yourself. So what is he gonna work in Jesus' life? Well, Jesus quotes this passage and he says, it's coming through now, today, I'm fulfilling this passage. So what does Jesus say his mission is in this passage? So we'll go to the next verse. To announce good news to the poor. Now, uh, to be fair, everybody needs the gospel, not just poor people. But both the Old and New Testament, Jesus and God emphasize love, care for the poor. And I'm afraid often we do not. Look at church in America or in Hong Kong, it's by and large middle class. There's probably nobody here this morning that's filthy rich. <laughs> now, by the standards of the rest of the world, most of you are. But by American standards, no, you're not. Uh, are you dirt poor? Some of you probably feel poor. <laughs> but I think part of the problem is that the church is generally middle class. Poor people think the church is for people that are better than them or for people that think they're better than them. And so sometimes it's hard to help people that are honestly poor and needy to feel like they fit, they're loved, they're cared for. Even when you do what you can to love and care for them. So when you go to a church in Hong Kong, uh, you know, of course, do things like pass out clothes. And, and uh, for 20 some years, we pass out food every single week. And sometimes it had results. Most of the time, actually, it didn't. Or if it had results, it had results in, uh, we were trying to recruit people for vacation Bible school, and they'd say, they'd say, well, I'll let my kids go to your church because I see you feeding poor people, so I know you're good people. But as far as the poor people themselves, they're harder to get. And, but, you know, we have had cases like, I, I came back from preaching in another church one Sunday, and... Uh, people kept teasing me and said, your friends came to visit you today. And well, what had happened, the, the people that we passed out food to were generally regulars. We got to know them. And there were three new people once, one day. And so they were asking us about our church and we called them and invited them. And then uh, that Sunday morning, uh, the pianist was practicing songs an hour before church. And these three people showed up. And that proves they weren't our members. <laughs> you know, an hour before church starts. No, that, that, that. And, but anyway, the pianist, you know, he, had, he gave him a drink of water and gave, asked him to be seated here, and he continued practicing. And so they were there through church and after church. And, and most people responded fairly well. And one sister said, well, actually, for street sleepers, they were pretty clean. <laughs> and that is surprising. <laughs> but, you know, think about how, what you can do to care for the poor and needy. Uh, 
one of our supporting churches in Georgia for years. Uh, one day a week had a food bank for like two hours or something. And a few years ago, I think because of COVID, they decided they should expand that because there are more people in need. And they expanded that. And then uh, last year, they decided to do a survey on where their new members were coming from. And you know where most of their new members came from? People that were originally non-Christians that volunteered to help them distribute food. They saw the church caring for people and they wanted to part of that. And they experienced God's love. So uh, Jesus said he came to share good news with the poor, the gospel for the poor. Uh, that's part of what we're supposed to be doing too. But next, like I said, he came to proclaim release for prisoners. Uh, there are a lot of different kinds of prisons, if you would, but uh, one of my students, his church, decided that they would specifically target prisoners. And so you go to their church and say, this morning after worship, we're going to write letters, pen pals, to such and such prison. And Thursday night, we're going to hold worship service or an evangelist meeting at such and such penitentiary. And then people get out of prison and they often find it hard to get a job because uh, you stabbed your last boss and the new boss doesn't want to hire you. But um, so, um, so they started a farm and it's an organic farm, you know, no human made fertilizers or pesticides or whatever. So uh, you're a prisoner, you can't get a job, you go out there and harvest whatever you can and sell it. And of course, you know the organic stuff, they charge millions of dollars for just a little bit. And, but it's an effort to reach, minister to prisoners. And the church will never be a big church because people are scared. You, know, you see some uh, visitor sits down and then realizes that the, per the guy seated two seats a row just got out of prison for stealing ladies' purses or something. <laughs> you think she's going to put her purse down on that seat next to her? She's going to clutch it all through the service, stare surreptitiously at that. <laughs> what is he doing? Has he moved? Is he threatening? But you know, they get ripped off doing that. They get abused sometimes doing this. And sometimes they get to see God change people's lives. Yeah. Yeah. Release the prisoner. So, you know, there are other kinds of prisons. Uh, a brother I know in Hong Kong, originally he was a banker, and he started gambling. And he couldn't control his gambling. Of course, lost his job, went bankrupt, beggared his family. And then he turned to the Lord. And he's been freed of his gambling addiction, and now he ministers full time, helping other compulsive gamblers be free of that and to know Jesus Christ. And again, you do that, you're going to get ripped off sometimes. You're going to see God change lives. You're going to see good news spread. People born again. <clears throat> There's a brother I know in Hong Kong who was a heroin addict for years. But then he came to the gospel, came to Jesus, was free to his heroin addiction, and then for years in Hong Kong helped people get free to their addiction by knowing Jesus Christ and then he decided to expand to <coughs> the other place <laughs> and set up a call it a farm um, it's basically you get the drug addicts to a boondocky place where they're away from the other influences their so-called friends that might supply them and to teach them a useful trade because usually uh, the trades that heroin addicts have are not the kind of trades that you know normal people <laughs> should have and, but again, the Lord changed him, and then is using him to change others. Freeing the prisoners. Releasing those in bondage. That's Jesus' ministry, that's our ministry. And then, recovery is sight to the blind. No, 
Uh, have you ever helped somebody blind see? My dad. Your dad? Good. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you read passages like this and some people say, well, have you ever worked a miracle? <laughs> have I ever come out to the other person who's blind and put my hand on their face and they say, all right, you can see now. And they take their hand away and oh, they still can't see. <laughs> we pray for the sick. And sometimes Jesus heals them. But obviously, uh, this is not heaven, in case you're confused. If it's heaven, it's a pretty cheap heaven. God is not going to heal every disease today. No, this is my, not my resurrection body. I hope my resurrection body has hair. <laughs> but, Jesus did tell us we could pray, and if it was his will, he would hear us. And so, uh, sometimes, you know, he does heal. It's not going to be eternally. If it were eternally, I mean, you know, eternally, physically healed now, then well, they don't get to go to heaven and be with Jesus. Only the bad Christians go to heaven, the ones without enough faith to be healed. So, um, Jesus is in heaven with the bad Christians, and the good Christians are eternally here on earth and, and you know, never get sick or die. Um, but our, our second son, when he was a baby, there was an accident. He was bleeding under his skull. And the doctor said he was going to die. And if he didn't die, he'd be a vegetable. You ought to see that vegetable run down a basketball court. <laughs> the Lord heals. The Lord heals. But even if he doesn't, we have responsibility to care for the sick. Uh, the picture, you probably can't see it very well. Uh, we're at a leprosy village. It would probably be correcter to call them ex-leper village. Uh, leprosy is curable now, but most of them are missing fingers or toes. Some of them, their skin is disfigured. They no longer have leprosy, but people are afraid of them. At one point, the village, uh, the government raised this nice, pretty new building, and I said, what's it for? The, the number of lepers is decreasing. And they said, oh, people with other terminal illnesses, we're going to put them here, and it's never been used. Because people with terminal illness still don't want to be in a place with lepers. So people are afraid. Basically, they're waiting to die in that leprosy village. And so, you know, you go to visit them, they welcome you. Because, <laughs> you know, most people are afraid of them. And the second time we visited it was the most moving because we got off the bus and this 60, 70 year old man, I started to run over to me, but he sort of waddled over to me and, and hugged me with his fingerless hands mm -hmm. and said, you came back. In other words, people usually see them once and that's it. People don't come back. And I, I, I don't know that it's a judgment on, but a, a lot of so-called short-term missions tend to, you know, find something you can do next to Disney World and then, you know, do it for one or two days and go to Disney World for three, and this was a short-term mission, but, or, you know, cute little kids but not people scared, dying, rejected because of the disease they once had. You can care for people. You know, if somebody's wheelchair bound, you can drive them somewhere or get groceries for them, take them to church. To do things, to show care for people that are sick or people with handicaps, Jesus came to heal the sick. We need to be concerned for the sick as well. So, uh, and then to set free the oppressed, and I put that together with the next line. The year of, well, no, 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 back up, back up, back up. <laughs>
Okay, down one. <laughs> Set free the oppressed. And, no, 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 no. <laughs> Stay on that one. Proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. <laughs> Pray for him. <laughs> what is the year of the Lord's favor? Is it this year? Last year? Last year? Old Testament, every 50th year, the year of Jubilee. You're a slave, you go free. You're in debt, debts are canceled. You're free. You're liberated. You're no longer oppressed. You think there are a lot of people oppressed. Now, some people, it's, it's you know, they're oppressed by an unhealthy relationship, a, a husband or wife that abuses them, maybe a boss, maybe a coworker, <coughs> maybe you have bizarre neighbors. Now, we live in an apartment, our next door neighbor downstairs used to complain because our sons walked on the floor. Now, I'm not sure what the other option would be, but, you know. <laughs> there are a lot of people in abusive relationships. They need to know one day they'll be free. In our case, it's, it's the government that, I have one student whose four co-workers are in prison, well, one's been freed now, for the hideous crime of training people to lead Bible studies. One church we work with has had to change their location seven times in the last ten years. You think, do they get tired of it? You know, is it, is it worth to keep at it when think just constant opposition? But one day they'll be free. The Christians have hope because God is our hope. Jesus is our hope. His promises are our hope. Whatever evil thing is at work and bothering you now or hurting the people you know, we have hope. Amen. You know, Amen. three weeks ago. We are free indeed. Amen. Amen. Those who set free are free indeed. Amen. Because he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. And he is in us. If you're his. Three weeks ago, my older sister's third son, 45 years old, perfect health, very fit, suddenly died of a heart attack. That's the second son she buried this past year. My sister's the best person I know. She adopted six special needs kids. Think. You know, it's hard not to think, well, why? Mm -hmm. You know, pick some mafia hitman who kills and murders people for money and let him have the suffering, but it doesn't work that way. This is a fallen, sinful world. Satan does attack the jobs of the world that God himself said was a good person. God said he was a perfect person. So, all of his kids end up dead. But see, we have hope. The ceremony at the graveside is not the end. No matter what sickness, no matter what broken relationship you're with somebody, somebody hates you, somebody mistreats you for no fault of your own, song that's old now, but it runs something like one day a bright new wave will break upon the shore 
and there will be no more crying, no more dying, no more war. And little children won't go hungry anymore. That's our hope. Jesus is our hope. We share that hope. We share that message. Jesus shared it. We share it. So Jesus reads this passage of scripture. He says that's what his mission is and therefore our mission is. And then, <laughs> go to the next one. The general stir of admiration. They were surprised that words of such grace should come from his lips. Is this not Joseph's son, they ask? It's like, I, I go back to my home church and every once in a while I'll, I'll say, you know, that it's intimidating to be there because people remember what I was like. And I get amens on that. <laughs> Jesus goes back to Nazareth and he preaches. And people, wow, Joseph's son can do that? But then, then Jesus said, no doubt you will quote the proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Jesus wasn't sick. What are they talking about, Jesus? Physician, heal yourself. Well, then they explain. Uh, we heard you did all these wonderful things in Capernaum and in other places. You healed the sick. You raised the dead. Well, what about us, Jesus? You're, we're your neighbors. We're your own people. Shouldn't you be using your powers to bless us, to bless the people of Nazareth, to heal our sicknesses, make us all prosperous? And you think about it, there's, there's quite a bit of gall in that. <laughs> you know, that, that God, after a thousand some years, sends the Messiah, the, the, the Word becomes flesh, God's own Son comes to earth, so they can bless the three or four hundred people that live in Nazareth. It's all about us, Jesus. No, Jesus did come to bless the people of Nazareth to save them, but he also came to save the world. Amen. And so then he says, well, you want me to just heal you, help my own people, use my powers just to bless you, just to heal you. Well, think about the Old Testament. Well, what, what okay, here we go. Elijah, lots of widows in Israel, but he helps a, today we'd say in Lebanon, Gentile. Not from God's elect special people. Probably ate pork. God sends Elijah to minister to her. And then Elijah's servant, disciple, whatever, Elisha. Lots of lepers in Israel. They don't get healed. Israel's enemy, Syria, Syrian general who has had victories over Israel, presumably killed Israelites or sent his soldiers to do the same. God heals him. Well, what's Jesus' point? His point is that God loves the world. The whole world. Red and yellow, black and white, they're precious in his sight. People like us, people different from us, people in Nazareth, but people around the world. Greeks, Jews, barbarians, Tar Heels. And who do they not like here? I guess <laughs> Hokies, Virginia Tech. No, I don't. <laughs> God loves everyone. He's unwilling that any should perish. Whatever race, whatever they're like, whatever they look like, whoever they are. And that, of course, sounds like evangelism and sounds like missions. And, of course, that's why I'm here this morning, or that's why we're, we're in Hong Kong. But God wants you to reach people. And they might be in China, and they might be your neighbor. And if you feel like that God is in your heart, Spirit is in your heart, saying, talk to this person, uh, then talk to him, visit him. And if God's, if you start to go, I 
No, God, don't talk about China. I don't want to hear it. I could never learn another language. I can never live in a little apartment. I can never eat worms. You probably already do. Um, don't tell God what you can't do, where you won't go, how you can't serve, because that means you're rebelling, and that means God has to force you to do that thing to have spiritual progress in your life. So the only way you can win this contest is to say, Lord, you can send me anywhere you want, but 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 please don't send me to the beach in Hawaii to do beach evangelism. <laughs> You have a, a new neighbor from Nicaragua or Italy, go visit them, befriend them. Maybe they'll ask you to eat. <laughs> Bring them to church and make your potluck season better. <laughs> but befriend them, talk to them, reach to them. Because the Lord wants them. The Lord loves them. If he wants Gentile enemy of Israel to be healed, he wants your neighbor to be healed. He wants your co-workers to be healed. He wants them to be reached. And depending on God's spirit, he can use you to help them, even though you know, I don't know what to say. I don't well, knock on the door and say, I'd like to meet you. I'm your new neighbor. Is that, that's, I mean, that's really difficult, isn't it? Or even better, bake some cookies first. <laughs> I mean, the people are prejudiced against Christianity sometimes, but they're probably not prejudiced against cookies. No. Yeah. So oh, he said, you invite your friends to church and they don't want to come to church. Well, wait till the church has this potluck or a special program because there are very few people who are against eating. Yeah. So the Lord Spirit wants to, can, will work through you to reach the lost, to reach the needy. To proclaim good news to the poor or the not so poor to heal the sick, to show care for the sick, to liberate those in bondage, to give hope to people that are in despair and hopelessness, to comfort, to encourage. You depend on him. Like he did one of our students who years ago was asked to go to China and he didn't want to go. It's backwards, it's repressive, it's dirty. And then finally she went once and she saw the need and she saw the, the hunger for the gospel and she started spending one weekend each month there and then two, two weekends each month and then every weekend and then she resigned for a job in Hong Kong and moved there to work full time with those subterranean assemblies and then ended up married to the leader of one and they helped hundreds of churches, many of them several thousand people in attendance, start Sunday school. Which, Sunday school does not sound revolutionary in America, in a country where people under 18 are not supposed to be in worship, uh, starting hundreds of Sunday schools with tens of thousands of students. is miraculous. But you know, Academically, she's not very bright. She often flunked. <laughs> Some of you can identify. <laughs> she has no obvious gifts. She's not a great preacher, musician, or you know, counselor, or whatever. But she loves the Lord. She depends on the Lord to work through her to do what she couldn't do herself. And I've often said, if I had no other students, it would have been worthwhile to use my life to have trained her. Because what the Lord's done through her. So the question is,
The Spirit of the Lord, sorry, I shouldn't have told you that. The Spirit of the Lord is also upon you. He wants to send you to proclaim. So the question is, what does the Lord want to use you to do? Who does he want you to reach? And are you willing? Are you willing? God's Spirit to work through you. Preach good news to the poor, freedom to the oppressed, healing to the sick, hope to those in bondage and despair. May the Lord use you. Amen. Amen. Wow, thank you, David, so much. The word invitation is an interesting one. Because quite often when we think of an invitation, we think about people who have never received Christ. And, and you may look around and say, well, who here has not received Christ? But when I think of the word invitation, I think of God's invitation to each and every one of us. And what's the thing that God is inviting you to do? Is it to repent of that one sin that, you know, after a while they become so ingrained within us that we don't think anymore about repenting of them or changing our lives? It's easy to get to that, that point. But sometimes God is at work just that little gnawing, that little quiet voice, or maybe it's the smack in the face. That happens too. Maybe the invitation is to, to greater service or different service to him. If you're outside of Christ, then the invitation is to begin to walk with him and to walk more closely with him and to find out how wonderful he is and what he wants to do for you what he's already done for you. And um, it's been a while, but there's water in our baptistry right now. Uh, our insurance company a few years back said, uh, you need to keep that thing empty. Because if a child got up in there and fell in and, and drowned, now that's tragic on every level, right? right. But now, there's water in the baptistry. It's also starting to get a little bit warmer down at the beach some days. <laughs> and I've baptized people in freezing cold waters, and it doesn't even have to be me doing the baptism, by the way. But if you're waiting for something, maybe this is the thing you've been waiting for. You know, Sammy quoted some fantastic scriptures out of Romans. Romans 1, Romans 10. <clears throat> In Romans 6, it talks about being baptized into Christ, dying to sin, dying to self, and being buried with him. That's the picture of going under the water. It's a picture of being buried with Christ. Being raised with him. Of course, we hope you'll come up out of the water. And that opportunity is before you. And, and maybe you're like me. When I was a little tiny kid, Okay, when I was young, I was kind of pudgy, but anyways. My parents took me to the church and did the right thing from what they knew. And they had me christened. A bottle of champagne hurt, but... Um, another one of those laugh later jokes, right? But when I got to be old enough to understand for myself... I knew that, I, and at that time I understood what sin was, and I understood my own sin, and I understood my inability to deal with my own sin so I could have eternal life. I needed Jesus, and I knew it. And at that point, when I made my own decision, I went forward in, in church in a service a lot like this one, and um, they were singing, uh, we were singing, where he leads me, I will follow, where he leads me, I will follow. And, um, you know, the preacher took my confession of faith and we went up and I changed my clothes and I got dumped in the tank. But because I was coming to him 
because I believed in Jesus and I was putting my faith in him that was effective in my life. I don't mean to preach a second sermon here today, but it was just the opportunity of what God has laid on my heart today. And uh, if you've never been baptized into Christ, you know, uh, maybe you're already a believer. Praise God for that. Maybe you're already putting your trust in him. Praise God. But to do what he has said is very important. And we need to be in the likeness of his death, dying to sin and self, burial and resurrection. And so please talk with one of the elders or myself or with David or with lots of other people who have learned about Jesus and can help answer questions. But make sure you do the right thing by what God says and come to him, humbling yourself, being raised to walk in that new life. I'm gonna ask Mike Rossi to come and have our closing prayer. And the invitation is not closed just because we're not gonna sing a hymn or we're gonna have a so-called closing prayer. The invitation is open as long as there's life in our, our lungs, air in our lungs. We have the opportunity to come to him. Let's stand together. Uh, Christine. Uh, there's, there's no limit. Um, I don't know that you need to be baptized more than once as far as God's concerned. But I know some people feel a lot better if they're baptized once they understand life better. And so I have done what I call rebaptisms. But uh, I, I don't always encourage it, but I also never forbid it. So uh, just my own personal view. Thank you. Sure. The answer is how many times does it take? As many as it takes for you to follow the Lord. If it takes right. more than one, do it. That's right. <clears throat> You bow your heads in prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we give thanks and praise to you, Father, for all the people that do your will. We pray for blessings for the people that are here, those that are not, those that are alive, online, those that are sick. We ask, Father, that you bless everyone today with the Holy Spirit. Help them to determine that they need you in their lives more, as we all do. Help us, Father, to follow your will, to be more obedient, we ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.